Well, good afternoon or good evening, depending upon which side of summer daylight time you, you, you wish to, uh, to choose. Welcome here to Samri, um, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. My name's Greg Mackey, and I'm privileged to serve as Chief Executive Officer with the History Trust of South Australia, and today as your Master of Ceremonies. On behalf of trustees and my colleagues, welcome to the inaugural Jennifer Cashmore Oration to be delivered today by Professor Gregory Crawford, about whom I will share more in short due course. I start our proceedings by acknowledging that we meet today on the traditional lands of the Kaurna people of the Adelaide Plains. I pay respect to Kaurna elders past and present and recognise that Kaurna and other traditional owners have an enduring spiritual connection to country. As a statutory organisation whose mission can be summed up as giving the past a future now, we share a strong commitment to reconciliation with First Nations people and to truth telling. Before I acknowledge other special guests with us this evening, it's my great pleasure to firstly invite senior Ghana man, Uncle, Uncle Mickey Kamatpi O'Brien, uh, to share a brief welcome to country. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the lectern, Mickey O'Brien. So welcome, welcome to the lands of the Ghana people, the spirit of the place of the red kangaroo, where we align along the Red Gum Forest River here, but particularly to this uh, oration. It is my pleasure as a descendant and an ambassador known as the impatient one, but also uh, when we bring uh, people to a place, we don't only just bring good health to you, we bring good blessings to bring the good spirits of our people upon you to bring uh, that uh, goodness, to send away that sadness that sometimes follows. And tonight, obviously, it's about that discussion around palliative care and uh, our people, uh, when it came to looking after elders, uh, would have uh, a whole of a community look after them because they saw them respectfully, they understood their knowledge and wisdom was really important. And so therefore it was a community that looked after them. But also in some ways they had other measures. Uh, sometimes it looked upon that maybe in today's uh, time, not so well, but when you think of living off the land, Aboriginal men would have sometimes a, a few women and also young women. Why? Because when they got old, they're not able to hunt anymore, therefore they need to somebody to not only care for them, but to be able to provide that food. And so we can look at those things in different ways and obviously, thankfully, today we have wonderful services and people to help us. But you're not here to listen to me, so I see these words to you. Uh, it's saying, let us continue to walk together, do it in harmony, do it in a way that brings cultures together and more importantly, never say goodbye. Always say see you later, because our physical may be temporary, but our spiritual is forever. So nakata, nechaya, and please enjoy not only this place, but the wonderful speakers you have tonight. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mickey. It's always a delight to have your presence in any gathering. Now, as I mentioned before, there are many special guests with us this evening, and while noting that hey, we're all special by simple virtue of being among the COVID-safe 120 guests here at the Samri Auditorium. I'm particularly delighted to welcome and again recognise Her Excellency, uh, the Governor of South Australia, Francis Adamson AC, and Mr Rod Bunton, the Honourable Stephen Wade, Minister for Health and representing the Premier of South Australia, Mr Peter Malinowskis, MP, Leader of the Opposition and former Minister for Health, um, our guest orator, Professor Gregory Crawford. 
the Honourable Dean Brown AO, former Premier and former Minister for Health. Elizabeth Ho, OAM, Chair of Trustees at the History Trust of South Australia. Trustees of the History Trust, uh, June Roche, Michael Neal and Eva ballon Vanuk, The Honourable Di Laidlaw AM, former Ministers for Health, the Honourable John Hill and, uh, and Lee Stevens, and the Honourable Michael Atkinson, who was a member of the 1990 Parliamentary Select Committee on the law and practice relating to death and dying. So, special welcome, Mick. And a, as a special guest, unable to be with us in person this evening, but attending via the miracle of the, the uh, internet um, live stream, um, I'm particularly uh, uh, delighted uh, to recognise our oration namesake, the Honourable Jennifer Cashmore AM, former Minister for Health. Uh, uh, a very special welcome to you and your daughter, Christine, out, out there in the interweb. There are many other distinguished guests here with us and indeed, as I said, each of you are special, so a very warm welcome to you all. I'm also particularly delighted to welcome newcomers to our History Trust community. Some of you may be here from uh, the health and caring sectors and may have never engaged with us as an organisation. In seeking to fulfil our charter as the History Trust of South Australia, and we celebrate 40 years uh, of existence this year, uh, our efforts extend well beyond our niche museum offerings enjoyed by tens of thousands of visitors every year at our dedicated migration, maritime and motor museums and our centre of democracy. The History Trust is keeper of the state history collection, some 44,000 objects and growing of specific provenance and significance to our state. We develop learning resources for South Australian schools so that in the future, more school age young people will learn more about our unique and fascinating history. We connect with literally hundreds of local community museums and historical societies across the state. We accredit museums, we offer annual grant programs to assist with museums and also to foster research and publication of South Australia's history. Our annual history festival reaches out across the state every month of May when thousands, tens of thousands of passionate volunteers and professional share, uh, professionals share hundreds of events with over 150,000 participants. Alongside our history festival, our annual Beta Birdwood run celebrates the automotive citizen collector in what has become one of the world's great motoring events. Over the coming year, in addition to our well-loved Talking History program, the History Trust will be presenting a small number of named orations, such as today's special event. But I digress. We're here today to inaugurate a special oration to recognise the important contribution of Jennifer Cashmore AM uh, to the advancement of palliative care here in South Australia. I want to also take a very quick moment to express thanks to organisational supporters of this event, in particular SA Health, the Office for Ageing Well, and Seniors Card for their assistance with helping us keep this event free of admission charge. Thanks also to promotional partners, Palliative Care and Coda SA. To tell us more about the contribution of Jennifer Cashmore, it will soon be my pleasure to invite to the lectern our Chair of Trustees at the, at the History Trust, Elizabeth Ho OAM. Some of you will know Elizabeth from her long and distinguished service as the Director of the University of South Australia's Bob Hawke Prime Ministerial Centre, or from her many years as Associate Director at the State Library. Others will know Elizabeth from her many years of community service in governance roles with Palliative Care SA or the Migrant Resource Centre or the Adelaide Festival of Ideas. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Elizabeth Ho, OAM, to share a few words. take off the mask moment. <laughs> um, can I firstly begin by welcoming Your Excellency and Mr Rob Bunton. It really is wonderful to have you here, particularly given the Family Association, Members of Parliament and former Members of Parliament, Professor Greg Crawford, Jennifer Cashmore AM, at home. Trustees, uh, my fellow trustees who do a wonderful job keeping our trust going and active, along with a great staff. And uh, distinguished guests, you are all very important 
and we welcome you all. I offer my respects to the custodians of this place, the Ghana people and their elders. And special thanks to Uncle Mickey for his very joyous welcome to country, always giving us another perspective, always taking us to the right place. Thank you. The unfolding of a sense of what is significant in our past can take time. Historical perspective is important. So why have we named this oration after Jennifer Cashmore? Each day, individuals and families face hard decisions about end of life. <clears throat> it was Jennifer who used her position to push our society beyond lip service towards an effective, practical human rights framework for those at the end of life. Informed by the community and concerned professionals, she cemented the transformative principle of patient consent that has shaped our modern societal responses. She would be the first to say that she did not do this on her own. But um, I think we can say that she was the catalyst. We can say that she was the igniter of the spark. And with her perseverance, the flame did not go out. I want to say something very briefly about women in politics. We pride ourselves on having given women suffrage in South Australia, and that included First Nations women in 1894. Even more startling at the time, we allowed women to sit in parliament and claimed it as a world first. How long did it take for women to enter the parliament of South Australia? Well, fast forward 65 years <laughs> to Jessie Cooper and Joyce Steele in 1959. We were the last state in Australia to elect a woman to parliament. And I guess that says something. How hard must it have been to overcome the prejudice? And if you got there, to perform and perform well. Jennifer Cashmore was only the third woman to be elected to our House of Assembly in 1977 as member for Coles. She was a Liberal and she held ministerial portfolios in health and tourism, but it was actually in a later period in opposition that she tackled the issues that we're listening to uh, this evening. A woman still among a sea of men, just three women were in the House of Assembly in 1990. A woman holding a firm belief in the rights of vulnerable individuals to choose and a compassionate approach and arguing for change. That background offers a compelling context for her achievement in bringing together both sides of parliament to address the rights of the dying and the nature of their care. Thoroughness is in Jennifer Cashmore's DNA. In 1990, after wide consultation and a huge amount of work, she proposed a select committee of the House of Assembly to examine the problems and come up with legislation. Her parliamentary colleagues on both sides were in no doubt that her commitment and sustained attention made her the best member to propose this. The then Labor Deputy Premier and Minister of Health, Don Hopgood, said in supporting her, I want to commend to the House the great deal of hard work and sensitive consultation that the member for Coles has carried out in bringing us to this point. She has left us in no doubt as to the genuineness and sincerity of her intention in what is, after all, a very sensitive area. The Select Committee did its work. Martin Evans, then Labor Minister for Health and a committee member, introduced the bill, but its progress was hampered by an election and a change of government. Ms Cashmore did not contest that election, but in 1995, Parliament finally passed the Consent to Medical Treatment and Palliative Care Act. 
Shortly after leaving Parliament, Ms Cashmore became the chair of the SA Association for Hospice and Palliative Care. She received her Order of Australia Award in 1998, referencing services to palliative care and also to the South Australian Parliament and to women's issues. Let's not gloss over the exceptional bipartisan work of the Parliament in this story. Using this example and speaking as a mere citizen, I wish we were more aware and appreciative as a society of the very best aspects of our democratic parliamentary system. It is truly a fine system in world terms. Our young especially need to understand this and the History Trust of South Australia is an ally in the business of educating the young in this regard, particularly through our Centre of Democracy. The Jennifer Cashmore oration will be presented in the future on an occasional basis. It will celebrate the remarkable health innovations, prowess and courage to be found in our state's history, but always looking through a social impact lens. Tonight we say a special thank you to Jennifer Cashmore AM, the Honourable Jennifer Cashmore AM, and express our appreciation to her and to her parliamentary colleagues for this legacy. It is a legacy of choice for the individual and it is a legacy of human rights. Thank you. Thank you so much, Elizabeth. And now to our special guest orator, Professor Gregory Crawford. As Professor of Palliative, Mem uh, pa Palliative Medicine at the University of Adelaide, Greg Crawford is an internationally regarded expert on palliative care, its past, present and future, with a particularly intimate knowledge of the South Australian and national contexts. There are none better qualified to deliver this inaugural Jennifer Cashmore oration. Professor Crawford's CV is both extensive and impressive. His commitment to the advancement of his chosen field of clinical practice is evidenced by his many voluntary and honor honorary roles. A palliative care physician with the Northern Adelaide Local Health Network, Professor Crawford has diverse research interests from psychological issues for patients and families and staff to cannabis use in palliative and cancer care and the complex policy context for vulnerable populations. His service extends to roles with Palliative Care SA as its current chair and is immediate past president of the Australasian chapter of Palliative Medicine within the Royal Australasian College of Physicians. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of the History Trust of South Australia to deliver the inaugural Jennifer Cashmore oration, please welcome Professor Gregory Crawford. Your Excellency, uh, the Honourable Francis Adamson, AC Governor of South Australia, Mr Rod Bunton, um, the Honourable Stephen Wade, Minister of Health, Mr Peter Malinowskis, MP, Leader of the Opposition, Elizabeth Ho, Chair of the uh, History Trust of South Australia, Greg Mackey, CEO. Distinguished guests, colleagues and friends, I would like to begin by thanking Mickey O'Brien for welcoming us to country and also acknowledge that we do meet on the lands of the Ghana people and pay respect to their elders past, present and emerging. It's a great honour to deliver this, the inaugural Jennifer Cashmore oration about the history of and the future for palliative care in South Australia and an opportunity to honour Jennifer Cashmore. So what is palliative care? I've found over 28 definitions of palliative care, and this is the WHO definition published in 2002. It does not say cancer. It does not say that the care is limited to a specific time frame. It does talk of caring for the whole person, for the person and their family. That is a community. And it does include bereavement. Definitions are important. 
there is the potential for confusion, confusion for the community and the healthcare providers. This can impact on policy development and funding, of models of service delivery and on who can access palliative care. And as we've heard, palliative care is much more than just a part of the health system. It's a public health issue, it has sociological aspects, and it's something that involves the community, but it is also a very personal experience. The challenge from my perspective is that death is such an important part of a person's life that there is only one chance to get it right, or perhaps, to put it another way, to make it as good as it can possibly be for the person and for those supporting them. And the result of good or poor care has a continuing and significant impact on our society. So let's start with some words. Hospice comes from a Latin word hospitium, meaning hospitality, as does the word hospital, as a place for guests. Current health policy calls them consumers. A hospice was a place of rest for travellers and pilgrims established and run by religious orders for travellers far from home and for people who were ill or dying. More recent examples of such mission and care are the Sisters of Charity in Dublin, established by Mary Aitkenhead in the early 18th century, and the Venerable Mary Potter, born in Nottingham, England in 1847, who established the Little Company of Mary. The term palliative care was first used in 1975 by Dr Balfour Mount, a surgeon in Montreal, in Canada. It means to cloak or to cover. In French-speaking Canada, hospice had strong connotations with destitution and disreputable institutions. <clears throat> it was not an acceptable word. Balfour Mount developed a comprehensive hospital-based service at the Royal Victoria Hospital in Montreal with an inpatient unit, a consultation service, home care program and bereavement support, plus research and teaching, the modern integrated specialist palliative care service model. In 1976, he established the Biennial Palliative Care Congress held in Montreal, which still influences palliative care clinicians today. He said in correspondence to my colleague, Dr Mary Brooksbank, that this all occurred in an environment of shrinking budgets, fiscal efficiency outcomes, and cynical colleagues who said he had no place in a tertiary care university teaching hospital. Some things feel like they've never changed. <laughs> he said it was easier to introduce palliative care units as there were already intensive care units and coronary care units. And now we just use the term palliative care or palliative medicine. But even palliative care has negative connotations. Regardless of what it is called, we care for people who are expected to die. There is some evidence that using terms such as supportive and palliative care or even supportive care increases referrals, particularly in acute hospitals. Dame Cicely Saunders in the United Kingdom is credited with being an early and significant pioneer of the 20th century modern hospice movement. She said, you matter because you are you, and you matter to the end of your life. We will do all we can, not only to help you die peacefully, but also to live until you die. But why was there a need for a modern movement? In 1952, a UK report revealed appalling conditions of suffering and deprivation among many patients dying at home with cancer. In 1963, a report by John Hinton showed that the wards of London teaching hospitals was full of people with terrible suffering that was, remained unrelieved. Most patients were aware of their prognosis, despite a lack of information, and care was very hospital-centric. Death became the enemy and a medical failure. The dying were seen less often by less senior clinicians, relegated to side wards, and some staff feared contagion, not dissimilar to the early days of HIV. You can see how the framework of the WHO definition relates to Cicely Saunders' approach. These principles have been at the heart of South Australian practice from its very beginnings. 
In South Australia, the development of palliative care service is a story of local movements, of passion, vision, of taking opportunities when they arose, of charitable and mainstream health funding occurring in different parts of South Australia at the same time, of coming together to amalgamate and to form regional services. In southern Adelaide, Kalara Hospital was opened in 1895. It was originally a TB sanitarium with 28 patients and run by the James Brown Memorial Trust, established by his widow Jesse to provide services for those in need. In 1902, a new wing of 12 private rooms was opened. Kalara eventually became a hospital with rehabilitation and allied health input, and a hospice ward was created in the early 1980s. At that time, Dr John Jackson was the superintendent and Kalara was a 69-bed hospital. In 1984, Dr da Jackson attended the International Congress of Palliative Care in Montreal and was inspired by what he learned. Kalara had a hospice of 24 beds. It was staffed with experienced nurses. There were multidisciplinary team meetings as part of allied health rehabilitation philosophy and the hospice was known as Goodwing. Kalara closed in 1988 and it is now a residential aged care facility or a nursing home. In 1976, Flinders Medical Centre opened and Dr Ian Maddox, a physician, was invited to join the visiting medical specialist staff. In 1978, Ian read an article in The Guardian Weekly. It was a front page article by journalist Victor Zorza and his wife describing the care of their daughter who had died in a hospice near Oxford. Ian was struck by the holistic, compassionate and supportive care not only of this young woman, but the whole family had received, that they were surrounded with love. He tried to influence the Flinders administration to use some of the yet unyet occupied newly built areas of the hospital for a hospice, but without success. In 1980, the Southern Hospice Association was formed the members here demonstrate the depth and breadth of interest in providing better end-of-life care. In 1985, this became the Southern Community Hospice Program. They employed some administrative staff and undertook a research project entitled The Unmet Needs of Dying Persons in Southern Adelaide. The report consisted of qualitative research interviews with GPs, district nurses, hospital staff and family members of patients. The results were impelling and are clear. At Flinders in 1987, the idea to advocate for a chair in palliative care arose in a casual conversation between Ian and John Blandford, John Chalmers and Ross Calusi, senior clinicians and administrators. Ian wrote a proposal for a chair or professor of palliative care with teaching, research and leadership roles, applied for the position and was appointed <laughs> the first professor of palliative care in the world. Professor David Currow was the second occupant of this chair which is no longer funded. Ian put the idea of re relocating Kalara Hospice to Door House to the SA Health Commission. They were planning, apparently, to move Kalara Hospice into a residential aged care facility such as the Julia Farr Centre. The Minister of Health at the time was Dr John Cornwall. He withdrew the funding of, for Kalara. He gave $100,000 to Calvary Hospital for the continuing function of the Mary Potter Hospice. And Ian Maddox's recollection is that $1 million was provided to fund Door House. Doorhouse Hospice had 15 beds. There was a, huge, a very large central day room, a central enclosed courtyard we called Hayman Island, <laughs> ramps to the outside gardens, a quiet room, double and single rooms, some of them you had to walk through to get to the other rooms, some shared bathroom and toilet facilities, there was a kitchen and laundry, individual meals were served, but it did leak seriously when it rained. There was strong empowerment and education of nurses. There was a real recognition of the psychosocial needs of patients and families. There were volunteers and community supporting bereavement groups and a day hospice program. Flinders University qualifications such as a graduate certificate, diploma and eventually a master's program were established. 
Ian set up an institute of hospice and palliative care at the REPAT and gained funding for a GP education program, which I coordinated between 1998 and 2000, providing teaching and clinical attachments for 30 or 40 general practitioners. The service was renamed Southern Adelaide Palliative Services while David Curry was the medical director, and Doorhouse closed in 2017 and moved to Laurel Hospice at Flinders Medical Centre. In 1998 to 2001, when I worked in the South, there were multidisciplinary meetings with ward and community team members and RDNS, the major community nursing service, about shared patients. The community outreach program was based at both REPAD and Flinders. RDNS and Southern Community Hospice Program had similar geographic boundaries and the community assessment model was home-based. I started the first outpatient clinic at REPAD and Norlunga Hospitals. Workload was increasing. Some patients were clearly well enough to come to us and some preferred us not to come to their homes. I remember one woman who could not find time for me to visit her because of hairdresser appointments. <laughs> clinic appointments worked well for her until she inevitably deteriorated and we supported her to die at home. The little company of Mary came to Adelaide in 1900, having been established by the Venerable Mary Potter. They wished to emulate the faithful companions who remained with Mary, the mother of Jesus, standing in spirit with her son on Calvary as she watched over her dying son. Their mission is of love, especially for those who are sick, dying or suffering and in need. Mary Potter Home has existed as a home for the dying since 1902. Mother Mary Potter Home, or Wing, was formally established in 1976 by Dr John Rice, Chairman of the Calvary Board. It became Mary Potter Hospice in 1986 and the current Mary Potter Hospice building was opened in 1989. It has 15 single rooms with small courtyards, an ability to move beds outside, a garden, a chapel, complementary therapies such as massage, music, aroma and art therapy and volunteers who run a biography service. At that early time, the model encouraged the patient's GP to provide care if possible, and a dedicated group of GPs to help with patient care and support the medical after hours roster. A partnership between Calvary Hospital North Adelaide and the Royal Adelaide Hospital appointed Dr Michael Ashby, a physician and radiation oncologist, as the medical director of the hospice and director of palliative care at the Royal Adelaide Hospital in 1987, and he took up the position in 1989. It meant a relationship with the tertiary hospital, dedicated hospice beds and an outreach service based at Mary Potter with close collaboration with RDNS. The medical staff position was supported by the public health system and hospice and staff offices were provided by Calvary. From 1995 until the end of 2008, Dr Mary Brooksbank took on the leadership and was known then as Central and Eastern Adelaide Palliative Care Service. The administrative centre moved to the Royal Adelaide by 2000 and then the community outreach program followed. Mary initiated a rotating liaison nurse position at the Royal Adelaide that provided palliative care training and experience for nurses, particularly from the respiratory and cancer services. By this time, Mary was providing visits to the West Coast and Port Augusta, as well as Broken Hill. Mary was very active in medical student teaching, developing a most impressive engagement with the medical curriculum and ensuring that palliative care is still a valued component of medical student education at the University of Adelaide. My first full-time palliative care work was at Mary Potter Hospice in the Royal Adelaide in 1997 working with Mary Brooks Bank and Elizabeth Keane, both formative mentors of my career. Sister Thora Sprecht, LCM, was the Director of Mission. She invited me to morning tea to get to know me, and not that she said so. I'm sure she wanted to ensure that I understood the philosophy of the little company of Mary. In 30 minutes, we covered contraception, abortion, euthanasia, pain control, and my own life story. <laughs> She was a formidable woman. <laughs> Sister Anne Sheridan was the Director of Nursing at Calvary North Adelaide then and later the Director of Mission. Sister Mary Glowry was part of the chaplaincy in Mary Potter Hospice. 
I remember sitting with her with a patient without family present who was dying and died. She was a woman of great faith and practical knowledge. Sister Shirley was the hospice volunteer coordinator, always cheerful and busy. There was a contract between Calvary Hospital and SA Health with various financial arrangements from 1989 until 2018. Up to six beds were available for uninsured public patients in Mary Potter Hospice and there was a formula that related outreach services. This allowed the uninsured to access the quality care that Mary Potter Hospice provided. In 2007, a collaboration between Mary Potter Foundation with funding from the Faye Fuller Foundation, the University of Adelaide and the Royal Adelaide created academic palliative care medical and nursing positions. <clears throat> I was appointed as the Mary Potter Senior Lecturer and then Associate Professor from 2018 to 2015 and the nursing position was occupied by Deirdre Worm and Wendy Jansen. This allowed me to build on Mary Brooksbank's education initiatives in the medical program. Every fifth year student in small groups now have two days of simulated end-of-life communication scenarios with actors in the high-tech simulation centre with senior clinician tutors. And every fourth year student now has a three-week clinical attachment in a palliative care or a cancer unit. Mary Potter Foundation funded a medical student prize and medal which further raised the profile of palliative care in the curriculum. This is now funded by Rest Haven Aged Care Services. By 2014, the amalgamation of Central and Western Palliative Care Services to form Central Adelaide Palliative Care Service, there were nominally nine public beds in the Queen Elizabeth in North Ground B, a ward there, up to four beds at the Royal Adelaide and 16 beds at Mary Potter Hospice with public and private patients. Now Mary Potter Hospice provides inpatient care for privately insured patients and an outreach program. <coughs> the statewide paediatric palliative care service developed within the cancer service at the Women's and Children's or Adelaide Children's Hospital and was closely supported by the Central and Royal Adelaide service initially. Sarah Fleming, a registered nurse, was working in medical oncology at the Adelaide Children's Hospital. She was part of a paediatric palliative care working party. She developed and taught a paediatric palliative care topic as part of the Flinders University Masters developed by Ian Maddox. I met Sarah when I studied that topic. Dr Michael Rice, AM, son of Dr John Rice of the Calvary Hospital Board, is a former chair of the AMA in South Australia and a paediatric medical oncologist. He was instrumental also in driving the need for paediatric palliative care. There were two reports that were important at this time. The first was in the early 1990s. It was into paediatric end of life and was undertaken by Drs Eric Sims, Michael Ashby and Bob Kosky. The second report by Professor Philip Derbyshire, Sarah Fleming and Amanda Haller exposed the unmet needs of families after the death of a child and demonstrated the huge suffering, loss and unmet needs. In February 1999, the Paediatric Palliative Care Service formally commenced with a single nurse consultant, Sarah Fleming. It was the first paediatric palliative care service in Australia and New Zealand. And Sarah has been endorsed as the first paediatric palliative care nurse practitioner in Australia and there are now five in Australia and New Zealand. The Western Palliative Care Service began with 12 hospice beds in the Philip Kennedy Centre at Largs Bay in 1985, a residential aged care facility. Dr David Thorne was the medical director from 1988 to 1998 and he had a general practice background. Marg Venning was the senior community nurse and Maria Brooks followed her amongst many other nurses. The medical staff were employed by the Health Commission or Queen Liz, but offices and hospice beds were located at PKC. At the time, this was a similar model as centrally with the relationship between Calvary and the Royal Adelaide. In about 1992 or 93, the offices were moved to the QE and four inpatient beds were also available on Ward 8A at the Queen Elizabeth. 
This all changed with the formation of Central Adelaide Palliative Care Service in about 2014. The funding for the 12 beds at Philip Kennedy Centre was withdrawn and those funds were allocated to increased community services. In the north, Modbury Hospice began in the 1980s. Modbury Hospital was opened by Premier Don Dunstan in 1973 and there were various owners and governance structures, both private and public. Initially, there were eight beds available and Anne Hoffmeyer was the first nurse unit manager. Sheila Roberts followed and she'd come from the Royal Adelaide as a nurse educator. There was a strong multidisciplinary team with support from oncology. There was a nurse-led community outreach program, a day hospice program, and after hours calls were managed by the hospice nurses. Medical cover was sessional and provided by a range of medical staff with disciplines that range from general medicine, geriatrics and endocrinology. <coughs> Junior medical staff were often shared with other clinical areas and funding came from various streams. These aren't the junior medical staff, there are a few politicians. <laughs> Dr Laurie Palmer, oh, what have I done? Oh, yes. Was appointed as the first full-time palliative medicine head of the palliative care unit in 2005. HealthScope was still running the hospital at this time, but his position was embedded within the Royal Adelaide administratively. In 2007, Modbury Hospital returned to the traditional public hospital funding model. These are some of the staff who, some of them still work at Modbury. Amalgamation of Modbury and Lyle McEwen services began in 2013 to create the Northern Adelaide Palliative Service. <coughs> the Lyle McEwen Palliative Care Service began in 1988. Chris Hoffmeyer started as a senior nurse for the service in 1989. At that time there was a nurse, social worker, an administrative staff member and various medical appointments. Part-time medical support came from Dr Jack Russell, a medical oncologist, then Dr. Ross Philpot, an infectious diseases physician. This was a bit of a leap into palliative care, but he is remembered as a wonderful physician and a very compassionate and supportive doctor. Then Dr. Edisham Abdi, Abdi, a medical oncologist. At about this time, the North West Adelaide Health Service was created, merging the Lyle McEwen and Queen Elizabeth hospitals. Change and amalgamations are not necessarily smooth or easy, and Dr David Thorne at the QEH is remembered as a saving grace for the service at this time. He had an ability to combine an exemplary mind with a truly compassionate heart. A variety of consultants from the Queen Elizabeth provided medical care, mainly Dr Sue Haynes, but also assistance from Drs Alastair Bonin, Adrian Barber and Christine Drummond. In 2001, I was appointed the first full-time clinical head of palliative care at Lyle McEwen. The service grew over seven years to two consultants, a complement of at least three junior doctors, a team of outreach nurses, social workers, volunteer coordinators, large volunteer group and for community and bereavement support, a structured education course for Lyle McEwen staff, continuous medical student attachments and regular country visiting to the Lower Mid-North, Clare, Borough, York Peninsula, Gawler and Barossa. From 2008 to 2012, Dr Christine Drummond was the acting clinical head until the merger to form the Northern Adelaide Palliative Service. In the country, there have been nurse-led services with nurses sometimes covering general as well as palliative care services to their communities from at least the 1990s. I was in general practice on Kangaroo Island from 1985 to 1997 and there was no dedicated palliative care resource and generalist community nurses nursing was only available during weekday office hours and only in the major centres and only on certain days. The country services generally accessed allied health and social work services locally if these existed and medical support came from the local general practitioner. With the development of a statewide clinical services plan 2009-2016 there are now regional services designated with different levels of expertise and all with formal relationships with the three adult publicly funded metropolitan palliative care services. Visiting to support these services was funded by a mixture of the Commonwealth Medical Specialist Outreach Program, some contracts with country health regions, private practice and the Rural Workforce Agency. 
Not only public funds, but also charitable foundations have supported palliative care services. Mary Potter Foundation supports a large amount of the clinical and accommodation needs at Mary Potter Hospice. Laurel Hospice Foundation, formerly Doorhouse Foundation, now has merged with the Hospital Research Foundation. And the Hospital Research Foundation continues to support palliative care with competitive research grants, untied donations for patient palliative care services, and has recently released competitive funding for a $2.5 million palliative care research program in South Australia. The Northern Communities Health Foundation funds many palliative care research programs in South Australia, has made donations to Modbury Hospice and has funded general practice palliative care education quite recently. The Modbury Hospital Foundation funds research and other non-funded palliative care patient services. There's been a long history of uh, collaboration across services with support from all the providers of care and policy makers. Dr Peter Last, working in the SA Health Commission, formed the Palliative Care Liaison Group in the late 1980s or early 1990s. This was a regular meeting of all the palliative care service leaders and representatives from domiciliary care, the equipment and allied health care providers, RDNS, the community nursing service, and SA Health Commission staff. One of the major tasks of this committee was to assist writing the report to Parliament that the Consent to Medical Treatment and Palliative Care Act required. Following development of a statewide palliative care service plan and then statewide palliative care service network steering committee was formed. It was ceased while Transforming Health was implemented and from 2019 a new palliative care clinical network steering committee is in place. The Hospice Association of South Australia was formed in 1983 with Ian Maddox's vision and run initially out of his office. It was renamed the South Australian Association for Hospice and Palliative Care in 1986 and in 1988 became the Palliative Care Council of South Australia and in 2010 was registered as Palliative Care SA. Jennifer Cashmore was the second chairperson of this organisation. It is the peak body for palliative care in South Australia. The vision of Palliative Care SA is that all South Australians facing death and bereavement are supported to live, die and grieve well and has a mission to promote quality palliative care and access for all South Australians through advocacy, information provision and education to build community capacity and service responsiveness. Palliative Care SA runs public forums and has produced many publications for the public and clinicians. It manages the Commonwealth PEPA program, the program of experience in the palliative approach, coordinating training for non-palliative care clinicians and clinical attachments with specialist palliative care services. Increasing death literacy and advanced care directive education of vital activities. This year PCSA has run a series of online podcasts exploring the issues about implementation of voluntary assistance dying legislation. The federal equivalent, Palliative Care Australia, arose from a meeting in 1990 at St Peter's College in Adelaide, organised by Ian Maddox. Initially known as the Australian, Australian Association for Hospice and Palliative Care, it is now Palliative Care Australia. Initially again run out of Ian's office in Adelaide, it is now the national voice and peak body for palliative care and is central to the federation of similar state organisations. The Consent to Medical Treatment and Palliative Care Act is pivotal to the provision of palliative care in South Australia. Jennifer Cashmore is a true legislative pioneer. She was a member of Coles from 1977 to 1993 and Minister of Health from 1979 to 1982. She has a background in advertising and journalism and is the first Liberal woman to sit in the House of Assembly with all the challenges that you can imagine that may entail. Jennifer Cashmore sought to establish a select committee, as we've heard, of the law and practice relating to death and dying as a backbench member of Parliament. The Natural Death Act was in place, was not well known or understood. There was no legal obligation for medical practitioners to inform patients of their rights, no provision for an agent to consent on behalf of another person, and a fear of prosecution if treatments were limited or withdrawn with the intention of allowing death to occur. 
Support came from many. There was pressure for voluntary euthanasia to be excluded from the terms of reference. Jennifer Cashmore insisted that this had to be part of the discussion, despite her own personal opposition to euthanasia. There was significant opposition from the Catholic Church and the Lutheran Church of Australia. Jennifer Cashmore was accused of embarking on a very dangerous project as far as the common good was concerned and that her actions would encourage public confusion and give occasion for mischief. But there was Liberal Party support. She consulted with Labor ministers, caucus, independent MPs. An important step occurred when the Minister of Health, Dr Don Hopgood, agreed to support the motion. Jennifer Cashmore wrote to every hospital, nursing home, retirement village and senior citizens club and all the heads of churches in South Australia. Here are the terms of reference. In a speech given by Jennifer Cashmore in 1990, she articulated the increasing ability of medicine to prolong life, the higher standards of living and greater longevity in South Australians, a greater incidence of cancer, a lack of emphasis on the needs of dying patients, that death-denying attitudes existed widely in both the medical profession and the general community, and public opinion demonstrated interest about these issues and about measures at the end of life. We should not be seeking apparently easy legislative solutions. We should be asking deeper questions. We should be asking why so many people dread the prospect of pain, of being a burden, of being in a vegetative or demented state and dread the loss of identity and dignity that goes with that. We should be asking how society can care more adequately for these people and relieve their suffering and loneliness. And we should be asking how we can help health professionals to achieve that goal. Here are the members of the Ministerial Advisory Committee. The media simplistically conflated death with dignity with voluntary euthanasia. They reported the opposition of the Catholic and the Lutheran leaders. Both retracted their opposition, but this was not reported. The media, media was generally characterised as not helpful. They lost interest, provided little reporting of the debate and provided no media coverage when the legislation was passed. The committee took two years to hear the evidence. It met 38 times, heard approximately 400 written submissions and heard evidence from more than 30 expert witnesses and issued three reports. The second report had 37 recommendations about changes to the law, policy on palliative care, professional education, community awareness, funding and reporting procedures. And the final report was delivered in 1992. I am not an expert about parliamentary process, but it appears to me that there were several real hazards in the process, not the least the way new legislation passes through both chambers of the parliament and the interruption caused by state elections and changes of government. The Consent to Medical Treatment and Palliative Care Act was passed on the 6th of April 1995, that is more than three years after it was first submitted for scrutiny by the Select Committee and more than four years of examination by the Parliament. It is said to be the first legislation in the world to include the words palliative care and the first to provide statutory support for the relief of pain and distress. The Advanced Care Directive legislation 2013 amended some minor anomalies and confusion between the Consent and the Guardianship Acts it takes a much broader view of health that is not restricted to end of life and provides a legislated hierarchy for agent decision making in the absence of formal documentation. Many have been involved but notably have been Dr Chris Moy, the current Federal Vice President of the AMA and Dr Christine Drummond. The Voluntary, Assistance Di the Voluntary Assisted Dying Act has been passed in South Australia this year. Access is expected to be possible by March 2023. And there is currently significant implementation activities occurring across the entire health networks for this to be implemented. So where are we now? Adelaide has three publicly funded adult palliative care services, a paediatric and country services, 
and the privately funded Mary Potter Hospice. I can speak about Northern Adelaide Palliative Services. This is my clinical home. And we are designated as a level six palliative care service. We service one third of the Adelaide metropolitan population from the edge of Gawler down to Clemsey. We have country relationships with Gawler, Barossa, Port Perry, Clare, the Lower North and York Peninsula. The administrative and community outreach hub is at Modbury Hospital. The community outreach program has over 500 families currently in our care and we receive over 1,200 new referrals each year. The length of care is approximately 90 days in the community and there are coordinated visits by nurses, doctors, social workers, pharmacists, OT and physiotherapists. Psychosocial supports are generally thin if not absent and there are very few if any employed psychologists in our service at present. Community and inpatient medical and nursing teams provide direct care. They provide direct assessment seven days a week and there is a 24 hour access to consultant medical advice for patients, families and clinicians. The current death rate of people cared for by our service who die at home is between 38 and 50 per cent. The Australian home death rate is quoted to be between 4 and 12 per cent and research supports that somewhere between 58 to 70 per cent of South Australians would wish to die at home. That's well South Australians. There is a medical and nursing consultation liaison service in the Lyle McEwen Hospital. Outpatient clinics are held at the Lyle McEwen and Modbury campuses. The inpatient unit at Modbury Hospital is commissioned for 14 beds, but flexes up to 19 at times. It is on the fourth floor of our, the building. It has 10 single rooms and two four bed bays, no windows that open, and everyone shares bathrooms and toilets. I heard today that Jennifer wanted to make a hospital that opened windows. <laughs> we have direct admission of patients coming directly from home, bypassing the emergency department, if appropriate, 24 hours a day. This will depend on the person's understood medical condition, their goals of care, bed occupancy and nurse staffing ratios. And the average length of stay on our palliative care unit is about seven to nine days and 50% of admitted patients are likely to be discharged alive. It's a very busy place. So how is palliative care funded? Well, it seems to me complex. There were at times site-specific grants, funds through individual hospitals, private hospitals and residential aged care providers with Commonwealth and state funding as well. Here are the delineated jurisdictional responsibilities. Looking at the past, there is evidence of public monies, but many private sources, many joint collaborations and services provided from the creative use of various programs. Here are some examples of historical joint collaborations. For example, to construct the care around a community palliative care patient, there are often medical and nursing and allied health staff employed by SA Health, but allocation of resources designed at the local health network level. Activity-based funding models and some historical funding supporting these staff. Commonwealth programs to fund equipment and nursing, such as My Age Care and NDIS. Shorter term SA Health funded community programs with specific criteria, end of life packages and contracts with community nursing agencies and estate equipment broker. And what program it might be possible to access is usually dependent on whether the person is under or over 65 years of age. GPs are partially reimbursed by Medicare. Medicines in the community are generally supported by the Pharmaceutical Benefits Scheme, a Commonwealth program. Other medicines not stocked, reimbursed or available may come from public hospital pharmacies. And a lot of care is provided by families. In the last six weeks of someone's life, it is generally only possible to provide about one hour per patient per day of publicly funded direct care for a person in the community. <coughs> in a palliative care unit or hospice in Australia, the minimum standard 
for nursing care alone is six and a half hours of direct care per day. From the early service development in the south and centrally, it's possible to see the beginnings of the current South Australian model of palliative care service governance with inpatient tertiary hospital consultation liaison and community outreach program all under one administrative governance. This does provide continuity of service, of documentation and generally of clinicians when patients move between home, acute hospital or palliative care unit. It is not, this is not the case in many other parts of Australia where change of location may involve change of care organisation. Transition points are inherently risky in healthcare. Models to support people with non-cancer are one of our current challenges. Heart and lung failure and renal failure are generally long and slowly deteriorating conditions with unpredictable relapses, but are ultimately terminal. And it is impossible to prognosticate reliably, and generally people with these conditions are less aware of the terminal nature of their condition. I've been part of undertaking a short-term trial of a palliative care end-stage clinic co-located co co with res respiratory services in the Lyle McEwen, and we, des 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 we demonstrated significant benefits and cost savings, but currently there is no funding or workforce to implement a sustainable manner of such initiatives. In Australia in 2019, there were 292 employed palliative medicine adult specialists. 64% were female, and this represented only 0.8% of the employed specialists in Australia. AIHW data says that currently there are 1.1 palliative medicine specialists, like me, per 100,000 population in Australia. The South Australian ratio is said to be 0.9 FTE, the low, lowest in Australia, and the PCA standard says it should be 2.0 FTE per 100,000 people. We are training palliative medicine specialists in South Australia who are uncertain about employment, and some have moved into state and to New Zealand. And this does not even account for the staffing needs for nurses and allied health. Where is the workforce and funded positions to support those with frail ageing, dementia, lung and heart failure? A recent report by KPMG, Investing to Save, commissioned by Palliative Care Australia, aimed to model the economic case for increased palliative care service provision. They developed practical recommendations with a strong evidence-based economic argument. The bottom line would reduce hospitalisation costs of the dying by 12% per year. That's apparently $460 million. And there is a return on the investment. A return on investment. My wife manages the money in our house, but <laughs> if you think about that, it means... You think about if your bank provides a return for you, if you're fortunate enough to have savings, how much that might be. We know the provision of healthcare is expensive and it's not usual that you would expect a return. The KPMG report determined that with improved access to home and community-based palliative care, there would be a 100% return on the money spent. Investing in specialist palliative care services into residential aged care would provide somewhere between 180 to 400% return and increasing access to earlier and integrated palliative care service in acute hospitals would provide at least 168% on that investment. You will not be surprised that Palliative Care SA is lobbying for similar initiatives and investments for South Australians as we approach an election. There are so many pioneers of palliative care and you can understand the inherent risk in highlighting only a few. And so here is a tribute to some. Ian Maddox developed an extraordinarily comprehensive, integrated palliative care service in just 10 years at Door House. He's the first chair of palliative care at Flinders University, first president of the Australian Association for Hospice and Palliative Care, and the first president of the Australian New Zealand Society of Palliative Medicine. Dr Roger Hunt has worked his entire medical career in palliative care, and he has, had a strong, he has been a strong advocate for voluntary assisted dying legislation in South Australia. Dr Mary Brooksbank 
a meticulous clinician, pioneered the teaching of palliative care at the University of Adelaide, former chair of palliative care SA and chair of Grieflink. Andrew Taylor was the executive officer of the Palliative Care Council of South Australia from 1997 to 2005 and died in office. He was instrumental in the development of multicultural palliative care guidelines. He worked closely with the Aboriginal communities of Port Augusta and is remembered as tireless, unflappable and a professional advocate for palliative care in South Australia. During his social work training, David Roach's final clinical placement was at Kalara Hospital. He was employed by domiciliary care to be the social worker for Door House Hospice. He was chairman of Palliative Care SA from 2007 to 2011 and is a strong advocate for bereavement care. Karen Glatzer is a pioneer of palliative nursing in Australia. She was the first senior nurse in Door House Hospice and the community program and the first palliative care nurse practitioner in Australia. Sharon Price was a trained social worker who managed a large volunteer program for the hospice and community at Kalira and then Door House. She was initially funded by volunteer shop funds. She established a day hospice service and moved into hospital chaplaincy when she left Southern Adelaide Palliative Services in 2001. Elizabeth Keane is a pioneer of comprehensive, holistic palliative nursing. And Joy Nugent worked as a nurse at Mary Potter Hospice. She established the Mary Potter Foundation and also a private nursing agency, NurseLink. She has provided a service to many in the community, provided outreach into Asia and now runs Soul Talks. There is much that I have not had time to explore. There is a strong history of palliative care research in South Australia, particularly arising from Door House and Flinders University and the Northern Adelaide Palliative Service with collaborations and researchers from all the universities of South Australia have been involved and continue to be in palliative care. So what does the future hold? Our health system is clearly highly developed, but is under pressure. Our society has changed. There is the loss of the extended family, the loss of the caring maiden aunt. Most members of a family work or have commitments outside of the home. General practice is increasingly stretched and not all have the interest, time, skills or desire to provide palliative care. Our society is still death denying, increasingly elderly, with more people living alone. Mahatma Gandhi said, the true measure of any society can be found in how it treats its most vulnerable members. I reflect that when I first started working full-time in palliative care in 1997, there was no formal training program or recognised qualification for any health clinician, no secure career structure, no real job security. We were using our own cars to visit patients and stopping at phone boxes when the page are bleeped. The breadth of clinical work in specialist palliative care is challenging but hugely satisfying to make a real difference when everything feels to be out of control. My research interests arose from caring for a 14-year-old girl with cancer in collaboration with the emerging paediatric palliative care service in the first years of my career in palliative care. Living with her two sisters and a single mother, she wanted to be at home. We celebrated Christmas twice and she died in her own bed. I reflect on the six new patients, all in their 90s, who we have recently cared for. <clears throat> and of those not yet 30, <clears throat> who needed rapid and intense mobilisation of symptom management, of equipment, and planning to face an untimely and unfair death, or those almost inevitably in the prime of life, even with dependent children with motor neurone disease. Palliative care is not just for old people. Palliative care will eventually be needed for most of us. How a society cares for, funds programs and services, and enacts legislation for those facing the end of their lives remains vitally important today, but is not always visible, spoken about, or well understood. 
past informs the future. And this is certainly the case for palliative care in South Australia. Thank you. Thank, thank, you, thank you so much, Greg. Um, that's been an incredibly uh, rich journey. Uh, and um, I understand um, uh, Minister Wade and, and uh, Peter Malinowskis just need to uh, excuse themselves. And I thank you for your attendance. And hey, guys, no pressure. <laughs> we're, all coming, <laughs> we're, we're all coming down the pipeline. Um, no, I digress. Um, we do have time for a couple of questions, um, uh, and we have uh, a roving microphone. If you would be kind enough to raise your hand, um, we will uh, endeavour to get the microphone to you. We're all being shy. Uh, Rick Saar. Thank you. Thank you, Greg. What are the demographics in relation to the projections um, as we all age and as we're all older in terms of the funding that will need to be required, um, say, 20, 30 years hence? That's one of the slides I cut out. But if you look at population demographics, we used to be a square so that we had, or even a bit bell-shaped, so we had young people and not as many older people, but we've turned upside down. And so we have an ageing workforce, we have less taxpayers, and we have a really burgeoning, growing elderly population. And so the, pop the predictions are that cancer is going to become greater, that people will age, and that's why we need much more input into all of those things. Palliative Care Australia has a, a, a motto, a logo that says, it's everyone's business, and I think palliative care is everyone's business, but not everybody can do it, and so we need to be training and we need to be educating in schools, we need to be educating public, and it's not something you ever get it all done at once. I remember when I worked with Mary Brooksbank in her first year, she said, we're going to educate ourselves out of a job. We'll teach all these clinicians, we'll talk about death, and we'll show them how to do it, and then we won't need to be specialist palliative care services. Everybody can do it, and that is not the case. And I suppose what is the core issue of specialist palliative care practice is that you do take a truly patient-centred focus, and all health care should be patient-centred, but you take a patient-centred focus, that you listen and you communicate, you hear what's said and what's not said, and you help people to understand where they are so that they can make whatever real choices there might be when time might be limited. And that um, you have impeccable symptom control because you can't do any of those things unless you are free of pain or it's as best good as it can be that you're not, you know, heaving into a vomit bowl. And so it's really important that we have these skills and they are taught. And we teach undergraduates of all disciplines those skills but you, it's like riding a bike. You need to be doing it all the time to be good at it. We need general skills, but we need specialists. And how we are going to manage that with our society as it ages more and more is going to be a challenge. Average age of patients referred to our service is 75. Um, but we, as I said, had a string of 90-year-olds last week. And some of them still had their partners living with them. Some of them were still independent. Um, but the challenge is that you know, they're living alone. The people who might support them as family are elderly. And their children are not necessarily so young either and are often working still or trying to care for the next generation below them again. Um, um, is that a live? Yes. yes. Um, I remember in, when Jennifer Cashmore was speaking about the establishment of that select committee in 1990, she referred to the certain amount of tension that was already known of between other clinicians and those who were involved in palliative care, a tension which 
could probably be summarised as a reluctance to let go. 30 years later, how are things going? Well, I would like to say, Michael, that things are better, and they are in some places. And I think that South Australia leads the way, but there is a continual tension. And uh, I think about the treatment for cancer, you know, Childhood cancer, AML, was invariably a terminal illness. And when Michael Rice was first treating some of those children, his colleagues would say, oh, Michael, that's really unfair. You should just let these children die in peace. And now the cure rate is 70% for those children. But equally, you know, all these new immunotherapies that come for cancer make it harder to prognosticate, to know. And so the issue is that you should always prepare for the worst and hope for the best. <clears throat> and so, you know, you need to keep that in mind. And I suppose denial is a really useful strategy for all of us. You know, you hop in your car and you don't think about the worst. But we should all as a society be thinking about what we might want. That's why you should write an advanced care directive. You should at least talk to you, the ones who love you and who might be with you when it might be needed. They understand your values and wishes in life. But there are still places where it's always the fight um, and that to even talk about the potential for dying is to make it happen. I remember a 90-year-old, I said to him, have you ever thought about how things might unfold? Well, his eyes were like the lights coming down a tunnel. It was terrifying. Um, and, you know, it's ultimately death is a separation it's not something that many people clutch with eager vigour early on, but there are many people who come to a relaxed and comfortable resolution. And it's part of teaching clinicians about what are goals of care and listening to what people want. And it would be terrible to be on your deathbed and to say, I wish that cancer doctor hadn't given me one more lot of treatment. I wish I'd gone on that holiday. And that's the challenge and the tension and, you know, some things are easy in retrospect. They're not quite as easy when you're sitting there at the time. Um, I was particularly interested in your comment about um, the design of the places where people are. Um, I ha on my mother's side, um, one of them was a doctor in Ireland who designed hospitals where you had open spaces. I had an experience in the RA last year where I was in a room without... Um, access to outside areas. I have a 92-year-old friend who's currently in, in um, an aged care facility where she refers to it as being in a prison. And I would hate to be in a place where I couldn't actually open a window. And I was conscious of your reference to people living in a facility where they were dying and they couldn't actually go outside. So that is one of the issues that I would hate to see that we perpetuate, where at the end stage of our life, we couldn't actually open a window and couldn't actually go outside to breathe fresh air. I mean, at the moment, we can't in some places because of COVID. And on the other side, you've been silent in relation to people of, who can't speak English. And my husband at present has got cancer it's in remission, supposedly, but I might get to the stage where I won't be able to communicate with him because, unfortunately, I've not learned his, um, his language. And that is going to be an issue, I suspect, because of that population bulge where there are going to be a lot of people like me who've married people from other cultures, other language groups, and we're not going to be able to communicate with them. I mean, my mother was lucky because she couldn't speak Ukrainian or Russian. And if my father had died from a stroke or a heart attack, he died, fortunately, on a golf course. Yeah. So, so let me tell you about windows. I'm so really pleased to tell you. Can I tell that, you that it... But you were silent yeah. in that regard. Let me... I'll be, I'll, I'd love to speak about that. So Modbury, the new palliative care unit, has windows that open. My mother's residential aged care facility, well, she escaped to get outside. Uh, for the fresh air. And I think, you know, what is the essence of you as a person and where you are? And most people would say they want to be at home because it feels like, a pal like it's your, you know, castle. When somebody is dying, 
Often you find that you have a hospital type bed equipment turns up, you have visitors who come who you didn't invite to your home, they've come to wash you and do your drugs. And so that's why we need palliative care units that can be a place for family to come and be family so we can support people as they die. And increasingly we have windows that do open. A large part of my research um, over the last five or ten years has been into culturally and linguistically diverse uh, groups of people. And in the north we've got lots of populations. We've done some studies about advanced care directive legislation and how it works in people who are in hospitals, how it works in the Catholic, in the, in the Italian, sorry, the Vietnamese and the Bhutanese family communities. We found in the Vietnamese that the best way to actually raise awareness <coughs> of death was to do a video for them. So they could talk about the video in the third person so it was not disrespectful. To even ask the question about death and dying to an elderly Vietnamese person would be very confronting and they would be highly offended. We've been doing studies with the African communities out in the northern suburbs and we got invited to come and talk to them and I said to the person who invited us to the African communities, should we bring a PowerPoint or some pamphlets? She said, no, 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 don't do any of that. Just come and ask us some questions and listen to us. And she said, <clears throat> if they stop asking you questions, you know that you haven't made it. Um, you need, if they keep asking you questions, then you're all right. And so not only did we have questions for ours, but we had to eat chicken and fish and chips <laughs> and salad with them as well. And so the challenge is that we are all individuals we all bring a culture of our own and there's nothing like facing the end of your life to think about what is important in your life. And that's why, you know, people revert to their original languages, people revert to religions and practices that were, they thought that they didn't need anymore. Um, because what is the essence? So, you know, this is a life and uh, it has to have meaning. All of us want to have a sense that we've made a meaning. Ladies and, ladies and gentlemen, I'm, I'm really sorry that we are going to need to um, uh, bring our gathering to a conclusion. Um, Professor Crawford, Greg, fellow Greg, yes. um, uh, I, I, on everybody's behalf, I thank you most sincerely for your uh, contribution. A very, very expansive account of the history of palliative care and some interesting and, and very poignant reflections on uh, the future. I uh, thank you all for your attendance and uh, we do have a, a, a small uh, gesture uh, of thanks to um, uh, give you uh, after the, the gathering, but no, thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, please thank Professor Gregory Crawford. <laughs> My last words are to Wish you all the, the compliments of the season. We are now at that point in the, in the year and um, I look forward to hopefully seeing many of you at future History Trust events in 2022. Thank you.